YouTube, The Final Frontier. These are the videos of the channel C64 Woody. It's weekly mission to explore fun new topics, to seek out old tech and even older liturgy, to boldly go where no other dyspraxic has gone before. Woody's log, stardate 2020240.7. In an effort to set the modern Star Trek reboots apart from previous incarnations, the writers opted to use the multiverse or alternate timeline theory. This means anytime our intrepid explorers travel in time, they create new, wholly different timelines running parallel to the prime or original timeline. Given this data, we must conclude that the concept of a prime timeline is a myth, and any Trekkie who's upset about it and the resulting Kelvin timeline is just a Trekkie version of a boomer. If we go by order of production, we need not look any further than season one of the original series. The episode Tomorrow is Yesterday sees the Enterprise hurled back to July of 1969, just before the Apollo 11 launch. And it should be noted that this episode aired a good two and a half years before the actual Apollo 11 mission. In an effort to avoid discovery, the crew is forced to abduct Captain Christopher, a U.S. Air Force pilot scrambled to investigate. In doing so, our heroes have drastically altered their own history, creating an alternate timeline. At first, they conclude Captain Christopher can't be sent back because he now has foreknowledge of the future. Technology, existence of aliens, and the like. The crew later takes on another passenger in the same episode, purely by accident, a U.S. Air Force security officer. Thankfully, they keep him in the transporter room. Once Kirk and crew figure out how to return to their own time, they also realize the best way to return their guests to their timeline is to insert them just before their abductions. It's thought that this restores the timeline, but does it really? Or does it just create several different alternate timelines? Which timeline from that point do we see taking on the rest of the show? Similar questions can be asked of City on the Edge of Forever. An amazing episode to be sure, but do we absolutely know that Edith Keeler is originally intended to die in an auto accident on that night after going on a date with an unknown man? Or do we, again, now have several alternate timelines? And again, which one continues the thread of the rest of the series? The next generation is filled with alternate futures. While some are explained away as a Romulan plot or some other convenient plot device, some are never explained at all. Were these alternate futures the results of deviations from the Prime timeline? Star Trek First Contact is also another break in the timeline. This time creating two splinter timelines, one in which the Borg are able to assimilate all of Earth's population in the past, which creates its own time paradox, and another where the warp test flight happens without any interference from the Borg or aid from Picard and company. That time paradox I just mentioned, the Borg travel back in time and assimilate Earth at a time when the Borg were still in the Delta Quadrant and had never heard of Earth. Or had they? See Season 2 of The Next Generation, q -hoo. This paradox continues into Season 2 of Star Trek Enterprise. Star Trek Voyager's multi-episode arc, Year of Hell, also sees drastic changes to the timeline. We're never entirely sure if all of the changes are reversed. Also, Janeway is the bane of the existence of the captain of the time chip relativity, so much so that he basically goes criminally insane. Then we move on to Star Trek Enterprise and the Temporal Cold War. Star Trek Enterprise, the Temporal Cold War. Enough said. The less said about that, the better. 
Now we get to the creation of the Kelvin timeline. The events of the Narada traveling back in time permanently altered history. But instead of completely wiping out the previous version of, of the Star Trek universe, the Kelvin timeline runs parallel to the o original and any other deviated alternate universe created by Starfleets or the Borgs or uh, whatever race was in Year of Hell without any of their interference. You could argue that the changes made to the timeline in Enterprise created a new alternate universe where the events of, of the original series take place and the events of Discovery are prime or vice versa. Or maybe they do in fact both exist in the same timeline as we are meant to believe. Woody's Log Supplemental Conclusion Why even bring this up at all? Why have this conversation? Well, Trekkers, or Trekkies, love to argue, for one. Also, it's a bit of lighthearted fun. If you're not a Star Trek fan, then you probably just wasted some minutes of your time you can't get back. You could go back in time and not click on this video, but that would create two divergent timelines. So, best not do that. I'm honestly also tired of Star Trek fans harping about how something is or isn't prime. There is no real prime timeline. Heck, the producers of the original series weren't interested in universe building or developing a far-reaching canon. They played fast and loose with the rules because there were no rules. At the end of the day, Star Trek is great science fiction in the noblest tradition of the genre. It forces us to look at ourselves and ask hard questions. It touches on technology, faith, religion, humanity's growth, yet never fully answering the questions it raises. At the same time, it's often just fun camp. Camp with a deeper meaning if you're willing to tackle it, but camp nonetheless. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter if I'm right or wrong. I'm right. It doesn't matter if you think Akiva Goldsman and the current group running the franchise are ruining it. They're not ruining it. Or maybe they are. They're adding their voice to a story started over 50 years ago. It's 50 plus years of storytelling. Not all of them are going to be good ones. Season 1 of The Next Generation, for example. Season 3 of Enterprise. Season 3 of the original series. Parts of Season 2 of Next Generation. Some would argue Star Trek V. The list goes on. Not all concepts are going to stick. For a long time I wasn't a fan of the Rick Berman era until I've gone back and rewatched a good amount of it. I think Berman tried to micromanage too much. In prime example being his take on uh, the orchestral score music uh, for episodes. He was not a fan of actual melodies and he let composers like Ron Jones know. So yes, he did try to micromanage too much, and Star Trek was often good in spite of him, similar to Gene Roddenberry. I'd also say the same about him. Star Trek was often good in spite of Gene. All that being said, it's fun to get into the sandbox and build a hill to die on knowing that it doesn't really matter. There is no real prime timeline, but for simple storytelling, it's okay if you need one. Well, that was a lot of fun, wasn't it? Doing it in a framework of almost an episode of Star Trek. <laughs> it was meant to be completely tongue-in-cheek. Uh, the topic is kind of real for me. You know, I enjoyed, actually, a lot of the Kelvin timeline stuff. I can understand why some fans... Uh, especially with In the Darkness, why they're not such a huge fan of it. And I get that, but I really am not big on uh, questioning someone's fandom simply because they happen to like 2009 Star Trek or even In the Darkness or Star Trek Beyond or Star Trek Discovery uh, or anything new Star Trek so often I've heard, well, that's not real Star Trek. Well, technically it is. And so that's, this is my response to that. 
I'm really kind of sick and tired of that. Uh, but I figured I'd have a sense of humor and have, have some fun with it. The music you heard at the beginning was all recorded on my keyboard back there. Uh, after the Alexander Courage fanfare, the little piece that you heard is something that I came up with when I was a teenager, trying to think of something that sounded uh, Trekky theme ish, you know, he, you know, a Trek heroic theme. Uh, came up with that as a teenager. Never wrote it down in notation because I didn't know how. Um, it's in the key of C, by the way. So next week we're going to talk about dyspraxia or at least begin the conversation about it. And hopefully you will learn something. If you want to look it up, feel free to. I'm also going to talk about my experiences being on the autism spectrum. Now, this is only the first video that I'm doing on that. It won't be by any means the last or the most comprehensive. Uh, I really don't think that there is a way to do that in one video, but I'll try to put in as much information as I can from my own experience. And also, uh, in the description for next week's video, I'll put links to different organizations and things like that that talk about that. So come back next week. How do you know when I upload? Well, I'm going to tell you right now. I upload every Friday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Every Friday is when I upload, so come back every Friday. Or, if you don't want to remember or write in your calendar, hey, every Friday, hit subscribe, click the notification bell. Easy. And if you want even more insurance that you'll get the notification, check out the social medias, the Facebook, the Twitter. Uh, I'll always let you know when I'm uploading on those on the Facebook and the Twitter uh, or if I need to for whatever reason delay uploading if that ever happens I don't anticipate it doing so but that will be your first line of finding that out so check out the Twitter I don't know but somewhere Check out the Twitter, check out the Facebook. Also, we love keeping the conversation going in the comment section and on the Facebook. Uh, or you can tweet me. Sure, go for it. <laughs> uh, but check us out on our social medias. Come back next week uh, for the beginning of the conversation on autism spectrum and dyspraxia. So once again, thank you for watching, and I'll see you next week.